Do you want to talk more about all of this? So let's bring in Ben and Ben Talablu, a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies here to help break it all down. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, first off, I do want to ask you, who are the possibilities for the next president of Iran? You know, what's quite clear, and it's about day three right now, if you're counting in terms of the presidential election, or shall we say selection, uh, registration process in Iran, uh, you had somebody who was a former Speaker of Parliament, for example, uh, Ali Darijani, uh, who actually was barred for running for president in the election in 2021, the one that read to the promotion of Ibrahim Raisi to the position of president. Uh, he has expressed interest. You've had uh, Iranian newspapers engage a guessing game as to which former central bank governors uh, might be interested. There's been a perennial reformist candidate that te com tends to come into these uh, electoral contests. Uh, so right now we're watching a slow motion registration uh, that is not closed yet. But what thing is quite clear that the supreme leader of Iran, and that's a title meant to be taken very literally, is not interested in having somebody with an independent political power base or a large independent following uh, become president. And the reason for that is this president, the person who is supposed to serve a four year term uh, starting at, after the election, which is at the end of June, uh, will be president for four years. And that will mean Iran's Supreme Leader will be 89. And the chances that the Supreme Leader could pass during that four year term are quite high. And the thinking here is to have somebody who will not touch or not impact or not lead a preordained process designed to exclude them. I guess my question is, who is actually the leader of Iran? Because we know that when you think of the United States, for instance, you have President Biden. The president is, you know, the top dog there. But then when you talk about Iran, it's it's a little bit different. So who is in charge and what really is the role of president there? You know, the role of the president there, I'm glad you made this parallel because uh, it doesn't really exist at all to the uh, role of the presidency in France, the role of the presidency in America. Uh, indeed, the position of president in Iran in 1989, where there was a constitutional uh, uh, rewrite, you could say, or update, uh, was amalgamating and taking powers from the position of the prime minister as well, which also focused on domestic issues and economic issues, but on issues that are really of importance to Americans and to U.S. national security, the president has at best a stylistic rather than a substantive impact. But as we've learned over the past few years, style can have a substance of its own based on the personnel that they move in uh, and whatnot. Uh, but more importantly, the Supreme, the Supreme Leader of Iran, that's the title meant to be taken ra rather literally. That's the most direct answer to, his, to your question. Uh, and that individual is an 85-year-old man uh, by the name of Sayyid Ali Khamenei. Uh, and he sits at the top or the apex of Iran's political system. Uh, and what has helped keep him there and what has helped build his power base uh, over the past few decades. And make no mistake, that individual right now is the longest-serving contemporary autocrat in the modern Middle East. Um, what has helped keep him there is the military power of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which entered Iranian politics, Iranian society, Iranian economy even, after the 1980-1988 Iran-Iraq War. And that partnership in power between the military and the politicized clergy best represents the Byzantine structure of power in Iran today. I guess I have the question or the answer rather to what would be my next question here, but would whoever is elected the next president, would that impact anything related to the Israel Hamas war going on in Gaza? Is there any sort of impact there based on who Iran's president is? No, because in my view, that president will be continuing to serve at the behest of that supreme leader of Iran. But more importantly, when you look at this constellation of groups, these terror and proxy groups, groups that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has created, uh, like the Badr Corps in Iraq, the Fatimiyun, the old Afghan brigade fighting in Syria, or for instance, Hezbollah in Lebanon, or groups that they have co-opted, like Hamas in Gaza or the Houthis in Yemen. All of these groups are tentacles that lead back to one central node, and that's the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And those individuals are insulated from uh, the limited political swings that exist between different presidents in Iran. And that's why, unfortunately, you're about to see a full court press ahead rather than a change. 
Just a few days ago, the U.S. chose to boycott the United Nations celebration of life, so to speak, memorial for Iran's late president. Is any of that surprising? Is the U.S. trying to send a message of any kind? Well, it is sending a message. Uh, it is good to see. The problem is it's a bit too little too late, in my view, uh, for the U.S. and from this administration, because you've had at least a State Department spokesperson. I think you've even had a, a, a note from the White House and even a press release uh, end up offering condolences or trying to engage in diplomatic formalities, uh, as they say, or diplomatic niceties uh, after the uh, downing of the Iranian uh, president's helicopter. The problem is these niceties and these formalities are isolated from the reality on the street in Iran, which, as you saw within hours of even the tweet of the uh, Iranian president's helicopter gone missing, and then the crash, and then the confirmation of his death, they were felicitations all across Iran. You saw it on Persian language social media, not just from the diaspora, but from within Iran itself. Uh, and this just tells you uh, one thing, that the population was not really uh, in the mourning mode. Uh, for the butcher of Tehran. They were in felicitation and celebration mode. So to have America, uh, this you know, patron of liberalism and this patron of human rights and, and democracy, be you know, mourning or, or, or commemorating the death of this butcher of Tehran, that was exceptionally tone deaf and in my view, an own goal. So it's good news by me uh, that the US is boycotting that uh, celebration of life. And for those who look at uh, the world through the prism of international organizations, it tells you almost all you need to know about the zeitgeist of places like the United Nations if they're celebrating the life of someone like Ibrahim Raisi, who has only failed upwards in his career. Just a reminder, this is someone who, when he was 28 or 29 years old, signed off on death warrants with the stroke of a pen to clear political prisoners of largely but not exclusively leftists in Iran, uh, just with the stroke of a pen. Uh, and in some of the most bureaucratic banality of evil level moments that gained him uh, the honor and accolades of many uh, in Iran's injustice system. And you don't earn the title of the Butcher of Tehran lightly. That's not a title that is given to somebody, a nickname, very lightly. So I think that says a lot about who the people there view him as, right? Absolutely. It absolutely does. And in a period of time when you've had multiple rounds of boom and bust protests, the 2022-2023 Women Life Freedom protests in Iran. Uh, that was a massive anti-regime movement, part of a much larger trend of nationwide demonstrations we've been seeing in Iran from 2017 to present that correlate with more protester turnout and less electoral turnout. So all of this is about to come home for Washington in an inflection point uh, because the Iranians are about to have an election, I think, at the end of June, the 28th or 29th, you're likely going to have a historic low. And that offers the U.S. an opportunity to re-embrace the bully pulpit, to re-embrace that position of moral clarity that this whole affair offered it, and to stand with the Iranian people rather than to you know, offer uh, commemorations for their oppressors. A lot of people have been kind of following bits and pieces of everything that's played out since October 7th. So I want to get kind of a, a breakdown here. Can you explain to folks out there how Iran is connected to Hamas and to Hezbollah fighting Israel over in the north? Well, uh, as you know, after the uh, Hamas uh, terrorist attack on October 7th, uh, I think it was about a day or a day and a half after where the Hezbollah began to intervene as well. You began to see pressure on Israel from the north, particularly when uh, military operations commenced by the idea of uh, first against uh, Gaza and then moving further into Han Yunus and then moving further south as well. So there has been, as Israel has been trying to win a war on its southern front, it's had to defend against uh, Hezbollah rocket and mortar and particularly anti-tank and drone attacks, uh, which are an evolving feature of the northern front. That has led to the internal displacement of 60 to 80 to 100,000 people, depending on the period of time since October 7 you're talking about, simply from Israel's northern front alone. And the thing about both of these groups is that they are proxies of a much larger terror network built by the Islamic Republic of Iran called the Axis of Resistance. Hamas is a proxy that was co-opted by Iran because it was pre-formed uh, in Gaza. And then, of course, Hezbollah was one that was created by the Islamic Republic of Iran, born out of the chaos of the Lebanese civil war and the invasion of Israel there back in the early 1980s. So in essence, these are vectors of pressure Iran has to be able to limit the political and military scope for success that Israel has been seeking 
uh, since its response to the October 7 terrorist attack. And not only that, if you back out just a bit more, you look at what's going on in Iraq and Syria, where the regime has an array of Shia militia groups that have struck the U.S. over 170 times since October 7, particularly uh, leading to the death of three U.S. service persons in Jordan, I think at the tail end of June. Uh, this is you know, proof of one thing, that the Islamic Republic is able to sit back, look pretty, and have a whole series of regional proxy forces adjudicate its regional wars for it. And as you saw with the April 13, April 14 Iranian ballistic missile, land attack, cruise missile, and drone attack on Israel, this feeling of being able to sit back and look pretty will lead to emboldenment and overconfidence that will lead exactly to a proxy war leading into a direct war or a more hot war uh, or a more overt war. So this is a very dangerous thing to let fester. Uh, uh, and that's it, precisely what the regime is doing, to let this conflict fester, to turn a one-front war into a two-front war, into what we see, which is today, which is a six-front war uh, against the Jewish state. My last question for you here, I want to talk about another topic, uh, the Houthis. And we know that the U.S. has now done these strikes on Yemen once again on those Houthi targets. What do we know about all of that right now? This was, a, in my view, a particularly important and impactful joint military operation by the Houthis, uh, sorry, by, by the United Kingdom and the United States against the Houthis. You had seen a lull in the reporting uh, in a period of time now about these U.S. or U.S.-U.K. strikes on Houthi positions uh, in Yemen, even though you had seen an oscillation of these drone anti-ship cruise missile and anti-ship uh, ballistic missile attacks uh, on international shipping and even on some of the U.S. forces protecting uh, this international shipping and trying to ensure freedom of navigation in a place like the Red Sea. In response to this, these limited U.S.-U.K. military operations in Yemen, the Houthis have actually been digging underground, tunneling, moving some of their above-ground storage uh, missile and drone depots into subterranean missile and storage depots. And this strike uh, not only went after things, but went after people, it seems like, as well. Uh, there's various reports out there that about 12 to 16, unconfirmed is the exact number, uh, individuals were killed. And there are allegations actually in regional press right now that this joint U.S.-U.K. strike didn't just kill Houthi officials and military personnel, uh, who are, again, a proxy of the Islamic Republic of Iran, co-opted by the IRGC there, but also went after the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and Lebanese Hezbollah itself. And if that is indeed confirmed, and that was actually part of the target package of the U.S., that is an important game changer to watch in the southern part of the Raven Peninsula and in this multi-front war that we've been all seeing. All right, Ben and Ben Talablu, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and help break all this down. Is there anything else you want to add about really any of this before I let you go? Uh, pleasure. No, thank you so much. I think we've covered it. All right. Have a good rest of your day. You too.